I, I've been working at the Australian Institute of Sport for about sort of seven years. Um, originally from England, uh, from around Liverpool area. Um, and then I went overseas and uh, worked in coaching, professional coaching. And then I worked in coach education, um, played rugby league and rugby union, and um, ended up at the Australian Institute of Sport. Uh, just because I like working with coaches and um, I sort of, probably one of the biggest lessons for me is working with coaches from different sports, um, particularly rugby league, rugby union, soccer they call it over there, football, um, AFL, Australian football, uh, AFL, you heard of AFL, it's a bit like Gaelic footy, um, the Australian version of it and there's a lot of, I reckon there's a lot of things to learn from outside your sport and you can bring back into your own sport. I think that's my biggest lesson actually, so everything I try and when I talk to Marty or other people involved in rugby league, I try and bring ideas from the other sports. Skill players, just want you to quickly write down on a piece of paper, uh, your group, just all group together, and, and write the key things that you think at your specific age group that you're coaching, um, would you like to be able to see in your players? Okay? What do you want to what do you want to coach in your players? How do you see the end result of your players being? Just some characteristics that describe those players. We won't try and separate things too much at the moment, but decision making, making mistakes, problem solving. So if kids are solving problems, who sets the problem normally? Who would set the problem? Themselves or the coach. Yeah. And the kids have to try and find a solution for it. So what would, often, what would most likely be the case? Do they get the solution first time? No, and, and it sometimes takes a long time, doesn't it, for them to, to get it right. And I think that's the essence of real coaching, is, is how quickly can we get these kids to where we would like them to be? Should we push them, or should we just hang a little bit and let them discover a few things, make mistakes, and then step in? I think that's really good coaching. You know, that, that's, and there's no right way and there's no wrong way. It's a, you've got to look at your kids, you've got to look at the environment, you as a coach, and the club that you're in and all of that sort of stuff. So they're really good things. Problem solving. Can we have another one from you guys? Attitude. Attitude. You know, I hear a lot of that in, in senior rugby league in Australia. They go, attitude, attitude, attitude. Um, th that, that's a really good thing. Do you think attitude is something that should be imposed on players? Or do you think it's an environment that the coach can help create? Different, yeah, the environment, culture, yeah, okay, no, that's good, that's good. A couple from you guys? I think all things like commitment, um, adaptability, flexibility, versatility. Yeah. You know, not being a one trick pony as such, do a bit, try a bit of everything, do a bit of everything. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Okay, we'll go into that a bit more, but um, adaptability is like a key word we use um, over in Australia at the moment in elite sport because they're not particularly as big as. But particularly in rugby union, English players are a lot bigger. Uh, Kiwis are a little bit bigger. So what they do is they have to be more skillful. So that's the Australian culture is to have more subtle skills and be able to make decisions under pressure. And that's really what they try and do to, to get to the level to beat some of the bigger players. And it's sort of emanated through a lot of sport, um, uh, particularly team sports in Australia. So um, that's a really good one. Adaptability, flexibility, um, basically means trying to be effective get to an outcome in a slightly different way. Okay, so we've got to bear in mind as coaches, we may have a perfect way that we think we want to coach, but there may be other ways of solving the problem. And kids are, kids are quite smart, you know? And I think one thing personally I like is to have different kids coming to the table. You know, they don't have to fit into the way we want them to all the time. If they've got something quite unique, just, just let it pan out through the age groups and they could offer something that could change the game or they could really contribute to your system that you want to play in a way that you didn't quite imagine. Um, so, so those are things that, are, that I think are definitely important. There's some really good points here and I think we'll, we'll um, dig deeper into them as we go through because I'm just aware of time as well. So I've just listed some very general comments that um, I'm used to in Australia and New Zealand over the past sort of 15, 20 years. They enjoy their footy. So the elite coaches I've worked with and the elite athletes and the kids going through have all enjoyed their footy and you talk to the top players and they stay in the game um, because they start to realise they perform better if they've developed better when they were younger kids. So, um, so yeah, and they're competitive and you need to compete that competitiveness in there. You need to keep that there, all right? Um, they're playing, a, you know, the, the world's tough out there and um, you've got to find ways to, to win, 
All right, so kids want to find ways to win games, and there's always a score, there's always got to be a competition there, okay? We've got to be very aware, though, if we do too much drills, and there's no real outcome to it, and we keep labouring it, labouring it, and they don't engage, and they're not having fun, we need to draw the line somewhere, okay? Um, learn by doing, not by talking, okay? So, particularly in New Zealand, I found it really interesting that in New Zealand they learn by doing more than the Australians and the English. So, I'd say they like to know why they're doing it in Australia, um, what reason it is, and then they go and do it. Whereas in New Zealand, particularly in rugby union, they play a lot of games, and um, they talk about it afterwards, what went wrong, how could we do it better? Whereas in Australia, they tend to do that before they actually do it, and then they do it, and then they talk again after. Uh, I'm not sure about England, but um, you know, generally there's an over-analysis in Australia, particularly in rugby union, that they over-analyse stuff. In rugby league, it's a little bit more learned by doing. Okay, so that could be cultural. I think as coaches, we need to do a lot of this. Explain the rules, basically get out their kids and just go. Yeah, set the parameters, Go, just go, go, go. And if they're slow setting up, don't put cones out. Just say, go, 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 go. And force them into organizing themselves on the run. Okay? Because normally, traditionally in training sessions, we, we explain everything. It's all got to be perfect. And then go. And if something's wrong, we try and fix it. Well, in a game, the game doesn't work like that. You've got to create order on the run. All right? You can't tell the ref to stop. No, we want to do that one again. Or you get a second go. You get no repeats in the game. We actually need to get kids used to that when they're very young. Forget it, move on, move on, just do it. And just make mistakes and just keep going, keep going, and you'll start to see things happen if we keep doing that. So pushing the kids is quite a good thing. Um, <clears throat> they'll create a game understanding, so long as you know what principles of the game you're trying to enforce. Is it momentum? Is it momentum? Let's get a game of momentum going. And so what are the solutions to get the game going forward? And think of those on the run. You guys will know all your principles and the skills needed. I think this has been largely neglected. Awareness, uh, anticipate and read the play. For young kids, that is all about the game. It's designing carefully modified games that create the same patterns that, that the kid will need to make decisions the next year and the year after. So they need to have patterns in front of them and be able to see them run towards a player or see a cluster of players and decide to pass or should I run at the players first and pass? So awareness of the situation comes probably, I think, before focusing on all the skills of holding the ball correctly and all of that. They can learn that on the run. And you can stop it and then do a closed drill effectively for some of the technical stuff. But I would say awareness is your number one thing in coaching a team sport. Okay, And that comes through the principles of play. Uh, have we got momentum? Can we keep going forward? Do we need to move the ball sideways, width and depth, uh, flat, shallow or deep? Um, and then they develop um, this ability to read the play, and then they can anticipate, which gives them more time. Okay, so all your good players really look like they've got all the time in the world. Okay, but they haven't really. They've just read the play, and they've got a lot of time now to prepare for it. They're also effective under pressure. So what we're trying to look at is technique by itself is just a technique. It's nothing. But you put plus pressure equals skill. All right, that's not a, an equation that's, that's um, you know, isolated. That's just general to say that you never isolate a skill from pressure. You've got to train the two together. All right, you've got to have them together because it's not a skill otherwise. It's just a technique. And we don't train, train techniques. You have to train techniques within the game situation to make it into a skill. So drills has been questioned a lot in the last five, ten years in a lot of sports. Um, and I've done a bit of my own research on it, um, and it's interesting. So we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Okay, I just want to fire through some slides first, get going. Okay, coaching methods. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I think we must focus on the player's needs. What are the age group of the kids, and what are the skill level? Okay, and that determines how we structure our practice session. Movement skills. If I said what it, what's a core skill, um, here in England, which I did not long ago with the rugby union guys, I said, what are your core skills? Uh, run, pass, catch, kick, blah, blah, blah. They were all movement skills. Okay, they're not, they would be my core movement skills, but they're not the core skills of playing. My core skills would, they include those, but mine would be awareness and game understanding. The why. That comes before anything else. Because it's almost like you've got a solution looking for a problem. Oh, I've got a pass, great, we've learned it, but when, when do we use it or what do we do it for? So, 
the, the thing is, is to play lots of different types of games, not worry that there's loads of mistakes. Um, bring in the appropriate technical um, sessions to, to supplement those games, to improve the performance of those games. So you need to monitor and observe the performance of the games that you play and start to realise, well, what sort of passes or rules do we need to put into place to make those games better? And we'll talk more about that as well. So core skills to me is awareness first. The reason why they make bad decisions is because level of awareness is not great because they've been drilled too much sometimes or they haven't played enough games. If the awareness is bad, what normally happens is the, the skills break down. So go forward has been really sacrificed through overcoaching and drilling. Um, obviously the other principles of support, play the ball, pressure, defence um, and momentum. I think these come through in the games that we play and they start to become very aware of these. And I know when you talk to some of the top players, um, they will have a very good understanding of the game. They won't use the terms, but they will know this. They will, know, they will just know what to do and when to do it, and they'll know why. They may not be able to verbalise it and say, oh, look, we know we had some depth. We had to create some depth because we were under pressure. I kept two people wide because I wanted to draw in the, the compressed defence here and pull them wide. They may not be able to literally say it, but they can feel momentum. They can feel pressure, and they know when they need to go forward or wide. Um, these are things, I think, that need to be developed in a layering approach with kids. So um, you don't teach them all at one go, but maybe at a particular age group, maybe it's just go forward. Or maybe it's just to be able to move the ball with width, see that we need to move it wide. Or maybe it's a mixture of both. Let's play a game with both. And you just focus on that theme, that one theme. And the passing needed to execute that will almost be layered on that game. They're the sort of passes you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to take a few steps forward and pass at least two or three metres just to engage a defender. Okay, so they're your themes of those sessions and you hammer those home. They really become the crux of your drills and your games. I feel that we've sacrificed a lot of this through too much structure in our games. We've actually lost the feel for a game, the feel, to be able to just be able to put more pressure on the opposition and know because of space and time. They focused too much on um, getting instructions and plays and patterns, which is not bad. They're solutions to a problem, but the awareness should come first. Okay, um, so the session, the traditional session would be more of a push session. The coach's knowledge, he then designs the practice, and then the practice session, it takes place, and then afterwards you think, oh, geez, I wonder what the needs of the players are now. Okay, I guess with the, which is, you know, that's the way I, I sometimes operate and coaches mostly operate. If you were to facilitate it, that would be more of a pull one and that would be coach's knowledge, practice design, do the practice itself and the needs. The needs always flow back and I think a good coach at being a facilitator rather than always the prescriptive coach which is always stopping and telling and, and that's good at times as well, don't get me wrong, these are just a continuum of methods, is that the needs is continually flying back into your bank of knowledge, thinking, how can I change practice next week? Maybe I should just keep doing this for a few more weeks until the kids get a hang of it before we go to the next level. All right, that's your bigger bank of knowledge. But in the practice session, I think this is the key one here, is good coaches adapt within the session, and they don't always have a lesson outcome after five minutes, we'll do this and then we swap over to there, all, everything's set up over there and then we move over to there and then, <coughs> and then your, your strength and conditioning coach ends up running the session for you. He tells you when to move across, you know, that, that's what's happening more and more. I think with this session, you need to just adapt the session on the run. If they're getting it or if you need to challenge them more or if you need to take the pressure back down, that's really, really adaptive now. We're, we're sort of like thinking, well, we've got a theme We've got an outcome, but we're not exactly sure how we're going to get there. But we're going to give it a go. And sometimes things don't work, doesn't matter, you know, because what it is, is it's information's coming out of the session back into you and you adapt again. So this cycle here is the critical one, I think, and, and good coaches tend to be very good at this. There's, that's a difference. The drill and the skill games, there's a lot more time variation. So who controls the information needed to control my passing, my running, is based on the relationship between me and everybody around me. It's not just in my brain, 
with no pressure on me at all. So we do need pressure from the start, and all your drills need pressure. You need decision making in your drills. Okay, so high repetition. The skill tends to be isolated. Um, the performance is very high, as we saw in the basketball, and the learning is quite low. They don't actually learn anything from those, they're just executing. Uh, there's no decision making normally in drills. Um, however, sometimes you can actually get decision making in a drill, which, which I re do recommend. Skill games, more variable. Um, the skill is in, a, in a, is in a context, so you've created the context for the skill so that kids know why, why I'm doing something. The learning is high and the performance is delayed. This is what coaches, I think, are quite often afraid about, is it doesn't look like they're doing really well. The parents are watching. Uh, it looks like we're not actually getting any better. But you've got to understand learning is delayed. Come back in two weeks' time, as you said before, oh, they've forgotten everything that we did a week ago, two weeks ago. It effectively means they haven't actually learnt it yet. So that, that shows you how do you periodise your training sessions. You should have a constant theme, which is always in every session. You know, and you do little add-ons to, to add to those themes. So to really look at learning, you need to block it and need to continually do it in slightly different ways. Um, and it's delayed eventually they'll get the hang of it. Um, game sense uh, specific decision making is different because that's isolated. It's not a decision based on a game, it's, it's based on the coach's rules. This is based on what they see. Okay, and that's different, that's game specific decision making. So you as a coach can really influence the games, um, which I think, I do a lot of so I work with Simon Worsnop um, on designing games and we have great fun looking at games and if they don't go right, challenging ourselves to go in there with the rugby guys now and changing the game slightly, taking two defenders off or telling two defenders or two wingers they're allowed anywhere along a channel just to see how that influences the game and we get out of the players, what pressure is this putting on you? And the players will give us the answers. They'll say, could you drop two defenders out there now? So they're helping us run these games, but that's, that's at an older level, all right, because they understand what we're trying to do. At the younger level, you can still put those things into place and, and the kids may not know the answers, but what they'll do is they'll, their behaviours will adapt to those rules. Great, because these guys are learning the skills in the backyard, they actually don't know it. And we found that now in Australia with our soccer. The best soccer players have actually learnt most of their skills before they got to the academies. And the kids are learning it in the games that they're playing, um, actually out of practice time, out of structured practice time is where they're getting the little twos on ones because that's all they can find with their friends is maybe three or four blokes to play a game, put the shirts down and go for it. So I think actually try and do that in your practice sessions, actually use sh jerseys. You know, I know it's different, sounds stupid, but maybe don't use the coloured cones, it looks structured. Just say, take your top off, use the jerseys here, right, you get a game going over there, just, just mix it. And they will almost feel like it's semi-unstructured again. So we're trying to structure unstructured practice in a way, just to get the kids to feel like they're back in their learning environments, okay? And, Guys, do you want to make any rule changes? What do you reckon? And they will make the rule changes because if somebody's not good enough, they'll keep them involved, otherwise they're going to have one less in the game. And so they'll change the rules to keep Johnny involved. Johnny, all right, mate, you don't have to make a tackle. You just get one hand on us and we'll go down. So they actually know how to adapt games themselves, and I think we should challenge them. We should really, really challenge them. We, 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 you could do a whole workshop on this, Marty, with... Um, and we'll probably do one at the end here, just a little bit of a practical on designing a drill, your favourite drill, and putting it into a game situation and trying to adapt to the rules or um, the, the regulations or the space and the time to make sure it gets better transfer into the game. Okay, so um, that's called the push effect. Um, it's where you've got the perfect technique um, the coach really looks at the errors and tries to correct them in the coaching session and there's a lot of telling and instruction, okay? That's normally the push effect. There's places for that, okay? It's not to say it's not good, you have to be sure that it's the right time to push. And then to facilitate, like passing, you may just say to a child, you know, hands out between the hips and the shoulders. That's a rough principle. And so entry through here and exit through the same entry point and exit point is the same. That may be a rough principle. So if the ball goes down at all to the ground and they follow through down here, the hands went down below the hips, they have a reference point. 
So they can actually give feedback to themselves. You've got to create a mindset with employers to be able to self-analyze and peer coach. All right, they shouldn't have to depend on you to tell them what they did wrong. So give them little reference points. Check, check, you know, and then generally they can get the ball through. Uh, you can work on specific techniques once I think that they're at that level to know that if they were to make a change to something, it's going to help them be more effective. Other than that, you're telling kids who just have no idea and they won't know what the consequences will be. Okay, so come in at the right time. Uh, manipulate the practice. Um, the kids need to discover and learn. So you're on, an, on this voyage with the kids to discover game awareness and principles of the game. And I think it's really good if they're old enough is to be able to, at the end of every session, um, I think with the older kids, give them a blank playbook at the beginning of the season. And they open it up and there's nothing in there. And almost like each week, the principles start to emerge out of the games that they play. So the games they play this week, what have we got out of it? Ah, right, these are the principles. So at the end of it, they end up with their playbook rather than a playbook given to them. And they just literally go through it. And it's, it's almost like learning for an exam. It's not really meaningful to them. All right. So these playbooks now we're, we're finding, um, particularly with the junior rep grades and the older kids, blank playbooks are really, really effective. And you have to manage it as a coach um, in terms of the key messages at the end of each week and bring it out of the kids. And they will come out with their own playbooks. They take ownership over it. They understand the principles of going forward. And all the structures that are layered on top of that, like the moves and the systems, are all just solutions to problems. You know, how do we get more go forward? Well, these are our, these are our three plays. <laughs> and they came from four weeks of practice where we, we came out with those, to just generate more go forward. So, you know, they don't start off with all the skills and the techniques because they're just solutions. They come up with the awareness of the game, the problems they're going to be confronted with because the coaches help facilitate that process, and there's a layering approach on top of that. Okay, what do we need to be effective? What sort of passes do we need to be able to do? Okay. Okay, so from that pull approach, the game is the teacher. It's not the coach. The game actually teaches them, and the pitch is the classroom, and the coach is the facilitator. So it's a, nice, it's a nice little thing. I always refresh my mind when I start to, you know, you can get frustrated, you can get too emotionally involved in what you're doing. Actually, it's the game that's meant to be teaching them. And I'm meant to be facilitating that learning process. And um, does, does that sound okay? It's a, it's a nice little one, isn't it? And, you know, the pitch is the classroom. You know, welcome to the classroom. Everything we do will be learnt on here, you know. And the games that we play will teach you. And I'm the coach. You'll say, who's the coach? And all the kids will go, yeah, you're the coach, you're the coach. And I always remember this Brazilian volleyball coach said to me, no, 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 I'm not the coach. I'm not the coach. The game's the, the teacher out there. I'll help facilitate this process. And, and I, I learnt off this guy. It was the Brazilian approach to coaching. And from that is the pull effect. And I think really... You know, there's more, there's more than this. I've just put these in there a little bit. Um, I haven't actually, that top right one shouldn't be that actually. <laughs> um, I haven't probably put that in. The, the, push on the, the push is on the left. The right is the pull. On the left, you've got high instructions. You've got drills and reps. Very technique focused. A lot of feedback and a bit of standing and listening. But you've got to have skills to do the push effect. You've got to know how to break a whole skill down. And the session will end up being part whole. So you deconstruct everything, you do drills, and you build it into a game, okay? And then a lot of demonstrations, and the kids end up copying and mimicking what the coach wants. So the coach has sort of suggested what we need, and the kids almost try and just copy that. You know, I don't know what it's like over here, but how many senior or good players are fearful of, of just going away from the script or trying something or, or, do, or being on the wrong line or just being in someone else's way? Um, that does come from this approach if, you, if you're too hard out on this approach. Um, so copying and mimicking for young kids is not a bad thing because <coughs> they want to see their hero. They want role models. Kids need role models up there and they want to see them play. And they want to try tricks and stuff at training sessions. Should be completely encouraged. You know, you should have creative sessions. Let's do something and just, you know, you kids do add something to this particular session so um, you know they don't have to do the same thing twice it can be something completely unique some kid might have a particular skill try and use it in the game you know we, we want to say oh we don't want them you know throwing 20 meter passes behind their back and doing all of this sort of stuff but 
I can guarantee if you've got a creative player very, very early on, they will help make your system work later on at the higher level. It won't be the system that makes that player better. That player will make your system better. So creativity and individualness, you won't generally get from the push approach. You get it more from the pull approach. Okay, And I think that's what the game needs generally. I'm an outsider here, but <coughs> generally I actually think that you need a very, very basic flexible system and you need your players adding to the system that you're playing here by, by adding more of their individualness to it. And as collectively as a group, with this method here, you create um, more combinations of players. Players can actually start to self-organize in groups of two and three and realize that they can actually beat those three if we tried something different. So we do a lot of that in um, an Australian rugby union. Um, they have what, what's called creativity self-expression sessions at the end of every academy um, training session. So you've got like 15 minutes for individual skills and individual self-expression. So kids can say, right, let's have a three on three and they can try different ways to beat those three on three. So in a game, when you go back to a game, these three players will just talk to each other in the game when the coach is running the next session and start to just come up with things, okay, rather than it's always from the coach. So um, that's more of, sorry, that should say pull. So that's more of a pull effect, and that should not say high instruction. That's low instruction. So skill practices using games, learn by doing, and there's a load more of these, and I'll give these slides to, to you. I wanted you to workshop some of these ideas, but I'm just aware of time as well. Okay. Uh, Matt says, <coughs> so if you're going to push a little bit, tell. If you're going to slide down the continuum, you're going to sell, share, and then empower. Okay. And great coaches are able to move along this continuum on the push and pull to suit the situation. Okay. So there's no reason why kids cannot be down this end at times or down that end at times. And you as a coach need to be able to shoot up and down here. You need to know how to tell somebody in a non-threatening way so they're not fearful, okay? But then also you need to empower them as well. And that's why I think the pull-push works. So you pull them, bring them in, open-ended question. What do we need to work on, boys? What do you reckon? You know, just start off with a game because you may have modified the game. Great, what's going on? Ah, oh, make mistakes over here. Well, let's do something there. Let's just do something there. So you've pushed them a little bit, then you play that new game or the new, new skill practice, and you pull them out of it again. Okay, you're getting stuff out of them. Okay, <coughs> a lot of listening. Communication is nothing without listening. All right, you can communicate, but it's all depending on listening. Asking, supporting, um, even to discuss with your players. Drawing out of them to discover and to unlock, all right, what buttons to press. Um, the push is still good, encouraging. I use a lot of rewarding in the games to change behavior. Reward um, is a good one. So if you're trying to change a particular behavior in a game, award points for it on the run. Have two coaches working with both teams, one with this team, one with that. You're trying to encourage something. It could be an unders ball or, or, or hit the front runner, okay? You could do a drill with that, all right, but there may not be any decision because you need to cue them into the defenders. So who is it, third man out, who makes the under and the over decision of the defense? Well, we need to cue that in. You'll reward that in a game, okay? So you can award points in a game. Even if they don't make a line break, just two points for making the right decision. Should it be under or should it be the front line runner according to the defense? And you can judge that on the run and have tally the points in the game on the run. Two points, two points good decision or getting the inside runner through the hole. Okay, may not score the try, but that's the aim of that particular practice, to get runners through, this, through these holes. Okay, so you award points for that. So that's reward, and I think that's a really good way to, to change behavior with positive reward. Uh, it's also encouraging them to be able to do that by setting the point system. Um, and I think one thing you'll notice too is if you, if you try and sort of generate a particular behavior, what normally will happen is they will try and do that all the time. So what are the defense gonna do when they, when they see that happening? They're gonna be able to come up with a solution, aren't they? So now it's about decision making, it's about awareness. When you, when you actually reward points for a particular play or behavior, <coughs> we're not gonna decide anything. There's no decision making going again because the coach has decided it. I've said, right, you know, learn to do unders. 
Senior players can manipulate it well enough to make unders work, but younger players will just keep doing it and it'll be so predictable. As the defence start to see what's going on, spaces will open up elsewhere. So your kids will start to realise maybe after a wee while that maybe the coach should award points for the space out there as well. Because if we get two for here and that starts to open up, at least we can get one point if we change our mind and go out wide. So the game is about decision making. It's about looking at options available to you. And it's about training that as a coach. Getting out there, select your options available to you, and then lay your structure on to be able to create those. Um, I don't know who threatens. I might have done it a few times in my career, I think. <laughs> I think you can get results from that, short term. Set goals. Um, if you assess and judge kids too much, I think they, um, you know, they, everything is, is um, you're trying to achieve performance too much. It goes away from development, okay? So when you assess and judge, that's really, you need to make it clear to your players, this is about delivery, it's about execution, all right? We, we want them to perform well now, no mistakes. That's performance at your training session. But if we're now trying to develop something or learn something, that's when, okay, mistakes are going to happen, boys. Don't worry about it but I want you to try and fix it, all right? Make your decision a good decision by how you respond, okay? Because gone are the days now of doing something, ball goes down, head goes down, swearing and all that sort of stuff. You've got to make it into something good. So don't, don't keep the games going, keep the games going, keep the games going. Don't always come in when something goes wrong because that's what the kids will remember. Fucking hell. You will reinforce everything, the feel and everything when something goes bad if you keep coming in at that point. I actually just let the mistakes go often and focus on the good stuff and grow that because then that will, the, the, the mistakes will limit themselves. Okay, they'll take care of themselves often. Um, leading and, and praising and criticizing. So they're just some um, verbs and adjectives that describe the, the sort of two approaches that you can transition between. Um, key messages, last slide. Um, allow kids to practice, make decisions. You know, Numbers of coaches actually say, yeah, I practice and so we do skills, we play games, whatever, but they actually don't say we train decision making. So that should be a kid, allow kids to make decisions in practice and actually encourage them to make some decisions in practice. Don't have a go at them for doing the wrong thing. Um, learning is messy. Look at learning moments, trying to create those moments, exploit them through pull, push, pull, okay? And then let them learn by doing and not a lot of talking and standing around which, which seems to be happening a fair bit. Kids learn the why before the what and the how. Okay, and I always elicit this. Understanding what a kid or player saw. What were they looking at? What did they understand? What was their intent? If you can tap into a player's intention, then you're gonna be a great coach. If you can plan in what they're looking for, then you're gonna be a great coach. If you can redirect their search to more important information, you're going to be a great coach, okay? If you can see through their eyes, all right? And it takes a pull, push, pull to be able to uh, elicit that. Um, and then a balance between telling the kids and actually letting them discover it. That's the key thing. It's a, it's a balance between those two. If you can try and get that, that doesn't crack under pressure as much. So the games you play, if they've come up with something, Brilliant, let's keep doing that now as a solution to the problem, all right? Under pressure, they will go to that because they came up with it, all right? It's a penny dropping moment for a lot of kids that come up with it. You knew they'd come up with it. Let them do it, let them feel it was theirs. All right, under pressure, that stays. Sometimes you need to tell, all right? So any, any sort of questions really, that's my final slide there. So um, anything you'd like to sort of ask before we wrap up and go and watch some games?